I pray that you know what freedom really is about today. Speaking of freedom, my soul has been set free, my heart has been set free, my mind is free, everything about me is free, and I'm excited to be with you here today. By the way, I forgot to mention this morning in the announcements that there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Ladies, if you're planning on being there for the women's breakfast this, this Saturday morning, if you would take time to sign up on the list so we know how many how many biscuits to make, and so on and so forth. And also like to say a big say, uh, welcome to a special family that's uh, dear to me, the Gibbs family is here today. I just, uh, you can't miss Brother Moose. We call him Moose because he's bigger than a moose. Amen, amen. I'm so glad to see them here today. I'm glad you're here. We're in the scriptures today. We're in the Old Testament. We're in the book of Exodus today, Exodus chapter 17. And we're going to be talking about something that is drastically and dynamically needed in our churches today. Today we're going to be talking about some lessons that we can learn from the battle of Rephidim. Now, right off the bat, you're going to look at your preacher and go, oh my goodness, he's going to have a history lesson for us. Yes, I'm going to have some history and things I want to teach you from the biblical past. But this is all a message today about how to win not just the battles in your life, but the war. Not just how to win the battles in your life, but how to win the war. See, we're in Exodus chapter 17 and, and verses 1 through 16 is where we're going to be reading today. But before we do, let me kind of set the stage what is, what's going on. In this battle, you're going to hear some words like Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites are distant cousins of the Israelites. In fact, when you remember back in the Old Testament again, back when you talked about Jacob and Esau, you can see that uh, in, through the historical genealogies that Esau had children as well, and these are the, the Amalekites are his descendants. So when we talk about the battle that's happening between the Israelites and the Amalekites, they're distant kin feuding back and forth. The Amalekites, as you remember, had had something against the 
Israelites back years ago when the days of their great, uh, with their grandfather Esau and Jacob, Jacob uh, ended up getting the family blessings from Esau by selling the soup and, and by the, the, the going in there and getting his blessings from his, their father Isaac. And they had a little bit of a, a grudge up against the Israelites and they knew that they were coming through and they attacked the Israelites and that's what we're going to be reading about today. In fact, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So let's just go ahead and stand. I'm going to read a little bit more lengthy passage than normal. So if you're not able to stand, please feel free to keep your seat. But if you're able to, starting at verse 1 through 16, I'm just going to read the whole chapter here today So it's because it's so important. The scripture says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water uh, for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may, may drink. And Moses said to them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They they be almost ready to stone me. Verse 5 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Verse 8 continues and says in the meat of this sermon today, it says, Then came Amalek and fought uh, with, with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. And he says, I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone, and they put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed upon his hands, the one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady unto the going down of the sun, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Behold, the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have with Amalek from generation to generation. Let us pray. Father, there is no single human being capable of delivering this message, for we are talking of fighting a battle and winning a war. Father, through these things, I pray that you would be glorified, magnified, and that we would see that, Lord, we got to have you. And Father, for the battles that we're facing, even around this room, I know that there are many Father, help us to see that there is a victory day coming through Jesus Christ and Him alone. Father, I pray that we realize the gravity of every detail and subtle nuance of the battles we face and the war that is winnable through the blood of Jesus. So, Father, I turn over my feebleness. We turn over our emptiness and weakness to You and say, God, here we are. Change us. Help us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The children of Israel, as we read, have been 
on their trek from Egypt to the promised land and reached a point of thirst where they were so thirsty to complain here they're in Yon. And God gave them water. For the name Rephidim means rest. God allowed them to come to a place where they could sit down for just a moment and have a little rest. They complained God had mercy upon them gave them a little rest. God gave them a blessing of having water to drink. And in the midst of this time of rest, they had let their guard down. And Amalek, Amalek, with his grudge, came against Moses and the children of Israel and attacked the tribes of Israel. Now, he didn't just attack. Amalek and his followers didn't just attack Israel. And understand how everything would develop. It, we, we don't quite see the severity and the, the harshness and just the cruelty of way, the way Amalek attacked Israel. For Israel used to march in like a, an arrow-type column. At the very tip of the arrow was the strong and mighty warriors of Israel. They, with their swords, would be the first to go into any conflict, and they would lead the, the tribes of Israel because of the strength. And next they would have the, the, the more seasoned men that... The, that that not able to fight, but could fight if necessary. And behind them they had the women. And behind them they had the children. And in behind the children they had the severely elderly and defenseless. So you could see the tip of the arrow, the spear, was that Israel was ready to face anything. But the Amalek, knowing Israel, turned around and fought them from behind to the front. In other words, Amalek and their cruelty and hatred attacked Israel and attacked its weakest part, the defenseless, the elderly, and the children first. And God says, get to it, get the battle raging. And I'm telling you what, I want to let you know right here and right now that God is wanting to fight your battles. He's wanting to be involved in your wars. Anything that you're fighting today, God wants to be at the center of that. He has to be. But I jump ahead. And in this picture, this battle scene, this battle array, Moses is called up to the top of the mountain and he is praying. And as he is praying with his hands lifted high, down below where the battle is taking place, while his hands are lifted up, Joshua, the mighty warrior that he is, he would be victorious and the tide would always be turning in favor of Israel as long as Moses was up on the mountaintop praising and praying to God with his hands up. And he grew tired as the battle grew on. And after a long period of time, he could not hold his hands up. And some wonderful things happened along the way. He had Aaron and Hur beside him and helped lift his hands up. That he could keep his hands to glory. For when his hands went down, the battle changed in favor of Amalek. But when his hands were up, it favored Israel. And in this battle scene, God has revealed four battle lessons that we have forgotten today. Children of God, brothers and sisters, my friends, we have forgotten how to fight the good fight. I'm just going to be frank with you. We have forgotten a skill that we have to have to not only endure, but to persevere and to be successful in this world. We Christians have forgot it. We don't preach it enough. We don't teach it enough. And we're not living it enough. I have news for you today that no matter what battle you're facing, God has a victory in store for you. So let the gravity of that sink in. That's not just some preacher talking up here. It's not some kind of pulpit language. God literally has a design for victory in your life. But he's got a process that he wants you to be understanding of to win this victory. And this is what we have forgotten. 
Brothers and sisters, I, I, I've preached many sermons in my life, but this is an important sermon because there are people on the verge of being crushed in this room, smiling, shaking hands, and living a life outwardly that looks wonderful, but inside we're scared, wounded, hurt, depressed, and just simply afraid. I'm here to tell you that no matter what you're facing, I'm going to give you the recipe of victory because it's plainly put out in God's Word. God wants you to win. And this is how He says to do it. He gets, in this story that I've read to you today, there are essentially four things, four things that we need to learn or relearn to get back in the game to realize that the victory that God wants us to have in our lives. No matter what, it may be finances, it may be health, it may be relationships, it doesn't matter what it is. If you know these four things, you will be as victorious as the children of Israel were as Moses was on the hilltop that day. First thing I want you to understand today, the first point. Know where your real battle lay. Where was the real fight fought? Was the real battle fought and won down with Joshua at the bottom of the hill in the midst of the scrapping and the sounds of swords and the, and the, and the, the, the fighting down there with, with physical things? No. The real battle, the real war was on the hilltop with Moses. Children, we have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten what the scriptures tell us over and over again. That, you know, the, the, we struggle not with fleshly things. Our, our war is not with, with the material things around us. Your battle is not with pain. Your battle is not with, with fleshly things of resources or lack of resources or your health. The Bible says our battle is a spiritual one. For we battle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and things that are invisible, folks. And we are down at the bottom of the hill fighting every day, striving to do our best, and we never make that real progress because we should be on top of the mountain like Moses. We have confused battle for the war. At the beginning of World War II, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th had a major victory as they destroyed the, the naval forces there in Hawaii. They had a tactical victory, but they did not have a strategic victory. Now, the difference between a strategic and a tactical victory is this. A tactical victory helps you win a single battle. They decisively won that battle. But they did not win strategic victory because the United States and its allies won a strategic and decisive victory over the Axis powers. We today, instead of striving for a strategic victory, we are bogged down fighting battles of tactical battles of victory. We win little things and we think we've won it all. No, we have only gotten to the next level, the next door, the next battle. We need to realize that we've got to get away from a tactical mindset to a strategic mindset. We've got an overall war that is winnable. Not these little skirmishes that we face every day. Through Jesus Christ, we have more than a tactical victory. We have a strategic victory. Amen and amen. See, the battle was not really fought and won at the bottom of the hill. The battle was only fought down at the bottom in a tactical victory. Amen. The one that won the war was the strategic victory while Moses was praising and raising his hands to God and that won the war. Yes, there's a battle at both the top and the bottom, but only one of them wins the war. We have forgotten. We have forgotten what wins the war. 
We get so bogged down seeing the difficulties in front of us and all the hardships that we face that we, we just face only these things. So, and I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you've got to separate yourself from the battle. Get on your hilltop, your mountaintop, and get your hands lifted to God and you'll have some victory in your life. Amen and amen. You better be counting my amens today, kids, because I'm going to be doing plenty of them. They told me in a sermon a while back that I gave, what, 27, 28 amens during the message. I'm going to, I'm going to double that today. Amen and amen. <laughs> See, the temptation for Moses was to get down at the bottom of the hill. The temptation of Moses was to not get up on the mountain and get away from the battle, but his temptation was to get down at the bottom and start doing the rough work and the fighting with his hands. We're tempted to do the physical work before we do the spiritual work. Church, come on, can we preach about that? Amen? We are tempted to do the physical work before we do the spiritual work. And Moses, we know his history. In the Old Testament, it tells us he was, he saw, uh, uh, he saw uh, back in the, in the Old Testament, he saw in Moses, in, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Then it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren, looked upon their burdens, and spied an Egyptian, smiting an Hebrew, and, and one of his brethren, he looked... This way and that way, and he saw that there was no man that he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses was a warrior. He was a fighter. He was capable of going down in the bottom, but and he was tempted to do so. Brothers and sisters, how many times when we are faced with hardships do we wear ourselves out physically and then only at the end of our physical strength do we go to the mountaintop and then we approach God as a last resort? There's an evangelist who said, you can do no thing until you do the prayer thing. You've got a situation in your life, in your friend's life, in the church, in any situation, you're in fitting distance. I'm sorry, you're sitting on the second row. You're in spitting distance. Amen. If you you have an issue of any kind, you need to be going to God first. Because you will always be struggling over and over again. And, And I'm here to tell you that many of us have been fighting battles all of our lives over the same thing, repetitively fighting a battle over the same things over and over and over and over again, trying a different little tactic to get it done. But what you should have been, first off, going straight to God and saying, God, here's what it is. The first thing that we've got to recall and or maybe even learn is that we've got to know where our battle really lies. The battle is not at the bottom of the mountain. The battle is at the top of the mountain. Prayer is our battlefield, brothers and sisters. James 4, 2, the second half of that says, You fight and war yet you have not because you ask not. Now, we misinterpret that many times. You have not because you ask not. And that's the truth. But the precedent is set. We fight and we war, yet you have not. You struggle and you keep going on and you keep facing the hardships and you're facing the pain and the things of the future and and every single day. and, And you wonder why you're never having any victory. It's because you haven't asked God first. To have victory in a life, it requires the power of prayer, the power of prayer, the power of prayer. I can't say that enough. Prayerlessness is one of the greatest crimes of the American Christian today. We have our flippant prayers where we say meals, uh, prayers over meals, and we have our routine prayers where we say the same words over and over again, and we treat God like a drive through But when's the last time you bared your soul to God and say, God, I'm broken. God, I'm wounded. I'm destroyed. And I will be utterly destroyed unless you help me. Children, Scripture says in Philippians 4, 6, it's be careful for nothing but in everything, everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Brothers and sisters, 
We've got to do the prayer thing first because our battle is won. Our war is won on the mountaintop with God before the, even the battle begins. Second of all, if we lesson we need to learn or relearn is that we need to lift up God's power. Back in verse 5, and also in verse 9, it says that he went up there on top of the mountain with the rod of God in his hand. Scriptures say that that rod, that wherewith thou smotest the river, take it in thine hand and go. What did that rod represent? It represented God's power displayed before man. With that rod, God... He, he laid it on the waters and smote the waters. With that rod, he threw it down and it consumed the serpents of, the, of the, the magicians of Egypt. That rod was a display of the power of God. We've got to face these battles with this understanding. Your strength means nothing. Your strength means nothing. In the face of a spiritual onslaught, you are so weak and you can't even make it a day. Not even a minute. But, through the grace of God through Jesus Christ, through the grace of God through Jesus Christ, it says in the scriptures that, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? Greater is He who is in me that is in the world. Amen? Amen? Whatever comes my way, I can face it because I have Jesus in me. This last, uh, the last two or three weeks have been just a, one thing after another in our lives. But you know what? We're smiling in our household. It's tough, yes. For two weeks in a row, we've had no plumbing. Praise God, it's been fixed every time rapidly, thanks to the kindness of those around us. Amen. But God picked us right back up. Our family faces difficulty with a, my father-in-law is fairly, fairly ill. But I know God's going to take care of that. No matter what I face, I'm a winner already. No matter what comes my way, I'm a winner already because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. See, the problem is today that we're trying to get God-style results without Jesus Christ. You can't get God-style results without Jesus Christ. You want miracles in your life? Then it has to come through the rod of God, the power of God displayed through man. It, to man, it's Jesus Christ. He is the di public display of the power of God. Did He not heal did He not restore? Did He not lift the dead from the grave? Our Lord is what you need. 2 Samuel chapter 22. The Scriptures say these things. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and, my, and power. And He maketh my way perfect. For Thou hast girded me with strength to battle. Psalm 68, 35. O oh God, Thou art terrible out of Thy holy places. And the, the, the God of Israel is He that giveth strength and power unto His people. Blessed be God. You know what we need to do? We need to pray the release of this God that is terrible against our enemies. We forget that God is just not just a God of love. He is a God of love and He will love you more than you can possibly imagine. But He is a defender of His children like a good father is. He will defend you. He will take care of you. Scriptures also say in Jeremiah 32, 27, it says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Exodus 15, 3 says, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. You want to win a battle? 
You want to win a war? You've got to get right with God first. You want to win the war? You want to win the battle both? That means you've got to lift your hands in praise to Almighty God. That means you've got to be on your face in prayer and you've got to turn it over. And I don't mean that you say the prayer that, Lord, please help me with this, and you, you, and you move on. I'm talking about you laying the burden down before God and you say, God, I cannot handle this. But you can. We've forgotten how to fight. We want to take it with our own hands. Let me tell you something, church, and let me just speak to this church right here. And if there's any on the internet listening today, you speak this to your own church. The evil one cannot stand against the power of God, especially through the bride of Christ. When the bride of Christ is standing in the shadow of grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, when they are lifting their hands to Christ completely and to God the Father at all times, get out of the way, Satan, a saved child of God's coming through. For who can stand against us? Is any weapon formed that can harm us? For I am a child of the King. I have been redeemed. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm renewed. I am powerful. I am a son of the King of all glory. Do you know you're a daughter? If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a daughter of a king. Did you know you're a daughter of a king? Did you know you're a daughter of a king? Did you know you're a daughter of a king? That makes you royalty. Did you know you're a son of a king? Did you know you're a son of a king? Did you know that if you, Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that means you are now royalty and you've got the army of heaven at your disposal? Glory to His name. So when I fight a battle every single day, when I have a hardship, I start out on my knees and say, God, release the Kraken. Amen. Amen. For I am a victor. I'm not just some weak person walking on the earth. You know what the, the, the word meek means? It means having all power at my disposal, but giving someone else the authority to use it. Want to call down fire from heaven? You want to be an Elijah? Just give it to God and he'll take care of it better than you could ever do. That's why vengeance is his. Because he can do it better than we can. Give it to God. Now I don't know if you've been saved or have been saved a long time or have never been saved, but I'm here to tell you this simple message. Unless, unless, you get on the mountaintop and recognize where your battle actually is and you give it to Jesus Christ. Let Jesus Christ be your warrior for you. You will never, ever, ever have a victory in your life. Simple as that. So here we are. I've got two more points to this sermon and you're going to like the next two, but you've got to come back tonight to hear them. Two tonight, I guarantee you've never, one of them you probably thought of, the ne one of them you probably never have. And the one that you never heard of is one of the most key things that you have been missing and you've overlooked. God wants you to be victorious. And so do I. So Brother Dale, how do we do this? First of all, we don't play games with this. Those who go into combat are combat veterans or anybody who walks into a fire or goes into a rescue scene or a, a law enforcement officer goes into a scene where they know there's an active shooter or anything like that, you go in with all seriousness. This is time to be serious. If you're broken, you need to be up here today. If you're hurting, you need to come up here today. If you are lost and you don't know what to do, you especially need to come up here. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are the primary one that needs to come up here because you are hopeless without Him. And I don't say that out of arrogance. I just say that as a fellow traveler. Because there's hope in Jesus Christ. We're going to have an invitation in just a moment. I'm going to pray. Give you a chance to come forward.
I don't care how big, how small. If you're not turning it over to Jesus, you're going to lose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, mighty and blessed God, I just, oh, Father, we just humbly place ourselves in your care. Father, whatever area in my life, in our lives, that we've never surrendered to you, O oh God, we finally give it over. If there's anything, Lord, we're holding back, mighty God, we beg and plead you'd forgive us. And we surrender all to you. Father, we've run out in front of you so many times and asked you to follow us when it's painfully obvious that we're supposed to be following you. Father, there are broken ones here. There are lost ones here. There are needy here. Oh, Father, break the wall around their hearts, my heart, all of our hearts, Lord. And let us simply come before you with lifted hands, professing our love for you and asking for help. Father, your word says that the horse is prepared for battle, but victory is only of you. Oh God, we give it to you. Take us and change us, for it's in Jesus' name we pray.